I tried to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I tried to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host, and this is the 111th episode of this podcast dedicated to the ongoing improvement of your brain, my brain, all of our brains, by every trick in the book that we can think of, and some tricks in books that haven't even been written yet. This is a book-related episode. We've had a few of these, but this time we're going to be talking with an author named Callum Chase, who came out last year with a book called Surviving AI, which I read recently. I thought it was a really good primer, kind of bringing somebody up to speed on where the state of the art of AI is is right now, some of the history of what's gotten us to this point, some of the fits and starts in scientific attention on the realm of artificial intelligence, and then a whole lot of speculation as to where it's going, what might happen next over the course of the next few decades, and how we should brace ourselves for what seems like a pretty big change coming down the metaphorical road, what we should do about it, how to behave towards it, whether to treat it like Santa Claus coming down the chimney or Dracula kicking in your front door. Those questions are still very much to be answered, but we'll be talking with author Callum Chase about his book in the main interview. If you hang around until the very end of the episode. I'm not even sure this isn't like a parental discretion is advised exactly, but one of the most interesting things that I found in Callum's book was a reference to something called Rocco's Basilisk. And its mention in the book was very intriguing. It was that the idea itself is so terrifying that I guess, you know, grown men are wetting their pants and things like that. Not all grown men, but some of them. Some people are taking this idea very seriously and are very, very disturbed by it. So if if you're like me and you're too curious not to uh, look under the bed when you think a monster might be under there, then go ahead and listen. But on the other hand, if you think that it might just send you spiraling into a catatonic tizzy, then we'll give you warning before that part of the episode comes up and you can just press stop. But as usual, let's kick things off with this week in neuroscience smart drug smarts this week in neuroscience so common sense would dictate that it's not such a weird thing to find a christian pastor who is very very religious very religious people are probably the ones who are drawn to becoming pastors and other professional level religious devotees of one faith or another so why is this worthy of mention well there was one particular pastor who's reported on recently in clinical neuropsychologist whose wife actually asked him to see a psychiatrist after about a decade-long period of time where he started becoming more and more hyper-religious and it's sort of excessively devout in his beliefs unwilling to have his authority challenged on scripture questions, unwilling to talk about or explore some of the ambiguity and in, in things that previously he had considered to be sort of the ambiguous sections of the Bible, that basically he was becoming more and more dogmatic, which in and of itself, because of his position, didn't necessarily connote anything. But when he started having problems with his memory, and this was about 10 years into noticeable behavioral changes, his wife said, you know what, something's wrong, let's get you in front of a doctor. It turned out that the pastor's hyper-religiosity was actually a symptom of something called frontotemporal dementia. Unlike forms of dementia like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, it tends to strike people earlier, affecting people as early as their 40s and up to their early 60s. According to Dr. Brendan Kelly, many patients with this condition exhibit problems with logical reasoning, language, and major changes in behavioral and interpersonal interactions. Hyperreligiosity has also been seen as a symptom in people with temporal lobe epilepsy, in which the person experiences seizures that originate in the temporal lobe of the brain. This new report adds to existing evidence suggesting that structures in the brain's right hemisphere, particularly in the right temporal and right frontal lobes, are implicated in the manifestation of hyperreligiosity. Now, by the time that doctors examined this man, his memory had actually gotten quite bad. He failed to identify some fairly recognizable celebrities and, in fact, could only recognize the portraits of six out of the last 12 U.S. presidents. I think there's a couple of really interesting things here. They, they keep, throughout this article, citing hyperreligiosity, although really from the behavioral conditions that they're describing, it really just sounds sort of more like dogmatism. And in this case, the guy's dogmatism was exhibited around his religious beliefs. But if he was, say, like a political commentator rather than a pastor, I, I would think that that sort of unwavering beliefs and whatever his opinions were, unwillingness to argue, would probably have been manifested in some other way. But I think if, if there's a takeaway, if there's a moral to this story, well, there's probably two. One is that it's an interesting case study looking at damage to this one very specific region of the right temporal lobe, because it seems like this guy had a, a very asymmetric form of brain atrophy going on. But the other thing is for people to just keep an eye on one another for major behavioral changes, it sounds like this is a case that probably somebody should have sniffed out that there was something not quite right much earlier in this story. But unfortunately, this guy sort of had the bad luck of, of being in a job, in a role where dogmatism is, is sort of shielded from criticism. You can imagine most other careers, you probably wouldn't be able to slide by so long as you became increasingly dogmatic and confrontational. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast where smart people talk about smart drugs. I would like to throw out a big thank you to Capitalist Pig, who left a five-star review on iTunes saying, Excellent podcast. 
I wish he'd also cover recreational drugs, but then he'd have to call it psychoactive substance smarts, which doesn't have the same ring to it. No, it does not. It's not an unreasonable request, and you're not the first person to ask for more coverage of recreational substances. We'll see what we can do there, particularly in the psychedelics, which I think are probably the class of compounds that people are most curious about if you're listening to this show. And there really is some great study that's being done now into psychoactive compounds for really the first time in about 40 plus years. The trick is, and it really is a bit of a trick, is getting the people that are doing the academic research into these compounds to really open up and talk about them. Because they're walking a fine line, they've just gotten past the review boards, they're getting their funding back for the first time in who knows how long, and there's still a decent percentage of the public that just gives a stink eye towards this whole concept. That you say something like LSD, you say something like psilocybin, and there's a certain swath of the public that's going to get up in arms. So the guys that are doing the research in these fields, they really kind of try to keep a low profile and just stick to the facts on what they can really show from laboratory results beyond a shadow of a doubt, because any sort of speculative optimism on their part is easy to characterize as, you know, sort of waving the pom-pom for illegal drugs. And with that, the risk of losing their ability to continue to do these studies to push some of this research forward. So that's kind of the lay of the land there. But nevertheless, we'll see what we can do to try to pull a psychedelic rabbit out of the hat and get a couple of episodes along those lines for you. We are in a pretty good weekly rhythm now with the Brain Breakfast Smart Drug Smarts newsletter, which I hope you will sign up for if you have not done so already. There are sign-up boxes selectively peppered around the smartdrugsmarts.com website, but most particularly at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. You can kind of think of the newsletter almost as a bit of a pregame show for some of the topics that we cover on the podcast. I'll go into a bit more detail on my thoughts of some of the things that we cover, or some of the topics that we're about to cover if it's something that we're sort of setting up but we don't necessarily have the interview taking place yet. So head on over and get yourself on that list if you have not done so already. Also want to thank several listeners. Got a ton of help this week from various folks reaching out with some interview suggestions, and in some cases the direct handoff of personal details for people that'll be future guests on the show. In particular, John Peden, Avi Roy, and Robert Ness all come to mind. Thanks to each of you guys, and you guys are not alone. Thanks to everybody that's reached out with some ideas by Twitter, through the website, or even at good old email. Mine is jesse at smartdrugsmarts.com. Last but not least, I'd like to give a hat tip to some of the older listeners we've got. I've heard from more than a few people, I I think this might have had something to do with the holidays, that are trying to get their parents or even their grandparents to try out the stacks that we've got over at axonlabs.io. Both mitogen, which is kind of an energy stack, generally physically helpful, as well as having some cognitive oomph from the selbutiamine. And then nexus, our cognitive stack, which as you know, includes aniracetam, which is part of the racetam family, is a great neuroprotectant. Good for people of all ages, but particularly for people that are getting up in their years. So if you're listening and you're in the silver-haired set, welcome, very much hope you enjoy and know that you are not alone. We've actually got a really, really interesting demographic of people listening to this show. But anyway, let's move along now to talk about probably one of the most trending topics in the past couple of years, artificial intelligence. Smart Drug Smarts. So I'm about to be speaking with Callum Chase, who is the author of Surviving AI, an earlier book called Pandora's Brain. And he's also working on a third book now, which is going to be due out later on this year, dealing with the topic of technological unemployment. But in this conversation, I really want to talk about the idea of an AGI, an artificial general intelligence, a machine which could be smart in the way that you or I are smart. And what seems to be a very good likelihood that when we're able to cross whatever threshold reaches an artificial general intelligence that's human level, there won't necessarily be any roadblocks for the intelligence to very quickly leave human beings in the dust, which is not something that we've had to deal with and opens up as many and as large of cans of worms as anything you could possibly imagine. So let's dive in with author Callum Chase. In 1999, I read Ray Kurzweil's book. I think it was the one called Are We Spiritual Machines? And that blew my mind because I'd always thought that um, computers would become conscious or intelligent in the way that we are one day, Uh, but I I just assumed it would be generations into the future, thousands of years away. And he made me think, actually, this could happen in my life or my children's life. So that was was a big wake-up call. And since then, I've been absolutely fascinated by where AI is going in the near term and reading everything I could get my hands on. Uh, That's that's what took me down the path of writing the book. It, It seemed like in the past three or four years, probably, AI has really just jumped up on social consciousness quite a bit. Is that having Siri on iPhones? Or what, what do you think the root of that you know, sudden resurgence of popularity in the concept is coming from? There's two things, I think. One is it's reached a tipping point in its effectiveness, and that's largely because of deep learning. You know, we, we all read about the extraordinary rate of development of speech recognition, uh, natural speech, natural language processing, image recognition that uh, companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft are, are achieving. And they're, and they're using this technique called deep learning, which is a sort of neural network. So it's a kind of the return of the neural network approach to AI, which was popular 40, 50 years ago and then died away and then came back and became useful because uh, big data made it work. 
So that's one thing, the arrival of deep learning and the tipping point that AI has reached so that it actually works really well now. And the other thing I think is the publication of a book, sadly not mine, but Super Intelligence by Nick Bostrom. It's a brilliant book and I heartily recommend everybody to read it. It's quite hard going, but it's, it's, well, worth the, uh, it's well worth the challenge. Nick Bostrom is probably one of the smartest people on the planet and he runs a, a thing called the Future of Humanity Institute, so not, nothing grandiose there, uh, at Oxford University, which studies existential risks and they I think rightly put AI at the top of the list of possible existential risks and that book Superintelligence woke a lot of people up to where AI is going in the medium term and, and those people included Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk and Bill Gates and once those three people started talking about it everybody else woke up too. So that was it I think spring 2014 that book was published and the world has woken up since then. Originally, because Boston in his book and those three guys as well, all said very clearly that AI could be the worst thing that ever happens to our species, but it could also be the best thing that ever happens to our species. Unfortunately, and, and inevitably, the press only heard the bad side of the story. And so the Terminator got de-retired and got an awful lot of exposure over the, over the, over the following year or so in every, in every article about AI. And now there's a sort of rebalancing of the discussion and it's a bit more even, even-handed now, which is, which is good. If you were to sketch out sort of the worst case, best case, medium case scenarios for AI in, in let's say, the next 20 to 30 years, let's keep it on a relatively tight time frame. What do you, what do you see as sort of the, um, the massive upside, massive downside potentials? Well, on, 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 in a 25-year horizon, I don't, I don't think we're going to get to the technological singularity. And that is the, the main, the, the, the most common interpretation of that phrase is the arrival of human level artificial general intelligence, which then quickly races past us in, in its own intelligence and becomes a super intelligence. And, and we become the second smartest species on the planet. This is slightly controversial in futurist circles because a lot of people think it will happen in the next 25 years. Uh, I, I personally don't. I'm, I'm not an AI researcher. So I perhaps shouldn't be in the business of making forecasts like that, but I just don't see that happening in 25 years. So the worst case thing that will happen to us in 25 years because of AI, I think, is the beginnings of technological unemployment. In fact, I talk about two singularities. One is the technological singularity, the arrival of superintelligence. And the other one is the need for a totally new economic system if and when we get to the point where most people can't work because computers do all the jobs. You know, once a computer can do your job, it can do it quicker, faster, more reliably and cheaper than you can. Um, And you can't escape the dead hand of economics. You know, if it's possible for a computer to do your job better than you, it will do it. So I think in in 25 years, I think we may be starting to see technological unemployment um, and we may we may very well be having to recognize that it's real and have to change our economic system. And that's going to be quite hard. So I think that's probably the worst thing will happen to us in 25 years. The best thing that could happen to us is I think the, intelli- the, the environment becomes intelligent or intelligible. And this is the Internet of Things. It's been talked about for years. There's been a lot of hype about it, but it's finally coming. And it, it's the process of sensors and processors and transmitters tiny little things getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and being embedded into everything every seat every building every car every tree lots of them on each of us and they're all talking to us now fortunately we'll have an intermediary this will be our digital assistants the the descendants of of siri which will intermediate between us and all these chattering lifts and chairs but it will mean that we can know what's going on all around us without seeing it and we can plan our route through the world much more easily and have much more fun and get much more done. We can be tremendously productive and, and just have a lot of fun. So that's one huge thing that, the, that AI is going to give us. Uh, I think it's pretty much inevitable over the next 25 years. And, and it, it, there's a whole bunch of other stuff like self-driving cars, which in a way is part of the Internet of Things, that, that, that cars become not conscious but have a low level of intelligence which means they can drive much better than us and that'll save 1.2 million lives a year which is you know that's 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 something worth having and these digital assistants that i talk about they're going to be so important siri at the moment is a bit of a joke its descendants are going to be invaluable to us funny thing is we don't have a name for them yet i i often think about this you know what will we call these things we, we have one word names for most of the things that we find really really useful all the time so chair phone key house car and so i'm sure we'll have 
one or at most two word, two, two syllable words for these things. So digital personal assistant isn't going to cut it. D, DPA isn't right. Uh, digital assistant still isn't right. You know, one of the one of the things that um, is interesting about thinking about AI is sometimes it, we think of it about it as being physically embodied, like a, a a robot that has a very physical persona. And then there are other inside the machine, non physicalized AIs, like when when Captain Kirk talks to the Enterprise and it talks back at him. It doesn't necessarily have a body that goes along with it. And I would think that when when we start coming up with naming conventions for these types of different AI, those would probably be thought of in two very different things. I would, I would think of my R2-D2 robot as something different than the voice of my Google Glasses. Yes, although I think you'll you'll relate to the disembodied voice that uh, and, and text that your digital personal assistant uh, presents. I don't know if you've seen the film Her with, with uh, Joachim Phoenix, where he falls in love with yeah, his... Yeah. Yeah, that to, to my mind, that is the best movie that in the last couple of years about artificial intelligence by a very long way, and, and quite possibly. Yeah, the I best, would agree with that. Yeah, possibly the best movie about AI ever. Actually, it was brilliant, and and I love the way the director tried to pretend it wasn't about AI. He said, "Oh, it's just a love story." Well, no, it's not. It's a great story about AI, and this is incredible. But people are already falling in love with these digital assistants. Uh, are they really? They are. In, it started in China, apparently, and I have no idea what whether this is really true, but I'm told that Mandarin is an easier language to for, for machines to use. And so the Chinese version, the Mandarin version of Microsoft's equivalent to Siri, which is called Cortana or elsewhere, is very good. Uh, and it's called Zia Ois or something like that. I'm sure that's a horrible pronunciation. And apparently a quarter of the users of Zia Ois in, in China have told it with, you know, with no trace of sarcasm that they love it. And, and I read yesterday as well that there's another phenomenon that there are digital secretaries being marketed now. Uh, and I think x.io is is probably the leading one. And they arrange meetings. That's the main function they have. They, you know, you know, this terrible business where you're trying to arrange a meeting with somebody and, and it can take quite a lot of your time. Yeah. These things do it automatically for you. And quite a lot of the time, the people who are having the meeting arranged with them, who, who are the, the, the other end of the process, the respondent, they are not originally aware that it's a machine they're dealing with. And then they become aware. And then interestingly, they start corresponding with it, even though they know it's a machine, as if it's a human. And something like, again, uh, I think it's 11% I read in this article yesterday, that 11% of people who already knew this thing was a machine started sending it their best wishes, you know, sending regards and stuff and, and having little side conversations with it. So <laughs> I think this is a shape of things to come. I think we will relate on personal terms to these beings, these entities, which are not conscious. They are pre-AGI, but they just present as like people. And I think, I think we probably will fall in love with them. I like to think that we'll call them friends. And I want to claim that name if it, if it gets taken. Honestly, what that reminds me of is how so many young children have imaginary friends when they're whatever it is, four or five years of age, and they sort of you know, are, are socially trained out of that. Nobody grows up and maintains their imaginary friends. But as we start to have these you know, disembodied presences around us that we really can interact with, I, I almost kind of wonder if that, that natural human inclination to just anthropomorphize things is going to, um, we, we won't be trained to switch that off at a young age like we have been his historically. And what young children now do with imaginary playmates will be what adults do with our, our digital assistants. That, that's a really interesting idea. Yes, it, 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 they are extensions of our imaginary friends. You know, one, one thing that you touched on a little there that I'd like to go back again is the difference between something which might be highly intelligent and something which is actually conscious. That Those, those are actually two different things. And, and maybe if you could sort of unpack that a little. Yeah. And of course, this is all very fuzzy because we don't really understand it. Intelligence is hard to define and it's not one unitary thing, but a working definition is it's the ability of an entity to solve problems in a, in a wide range of environments. So we ascribe a level of intelligence to quite basic organisms like certainly chickens and to a degree snakes and maybe insects. Um, you know, they, they solve problems. Bees, you know, they have a level of intelligence. I think most people would probably agree with that. I think most people would also probably agree that bees have, if any level of consciousness at all, it's very, very slight, you know, almost non-existent. Now, machines already display a level of intelligence, pretty much, you know, certain, certainly at the level of some insects and... and yeah, my, my sea monkeys or whatever, I would I would think that my, my laptop's at least as smart as a sea monkey. There you go. So we, 
you know, we, we are already creating intelligence of a basic level. It's artificial intelligence. We call it that at the moment. That may come to be seen as offensive and maybe you'll switch to machine intelligence or cognitive computing or some other name. So, so intelligence is a range of abilities. There's an enormous range of abilities. And of course, we may not be the upper level of what's possible. We may be quite near the bottom of what's possible. But it's, it, it is the ability to, to do stuff. You know, it's a kind of a functional skill, if you like. And, and it's composed of lots of different skills. So human intelligence uh, is composed of lots of different types of abilities. And then there's this other thing, which is consciousness, which is even harder to define and much more mysterious because you can do experiments with intelligence relatively easily and you, you can see its outcome in external objects, whether they be animals or machines. You can't see consciousness in other beings. You can intuit it and you can infer it, and that's what we all do with each other. You know, I assume that you're conscious because you appear to be dealing with the world in roughly the same way as I do, so I, um, I have the temerity to assume that your experience of the world is similar to mine, and, you know, and that's your consciousness. Consciousness is an internal model of the world, and that's what our brains spend most of their energy doing. They create models of, of the world. They create representations of the world. We are confident... I sometimes wonder whether we are right to be so confident, but, you know, but we are confident we haven't created consciousness in a machine yet. And one of the fascinating things is we don't know when we create an, intelligence, an intelligent machine which can do everything as well as we can, will it be conscious? We don't know yet. It seems to me implausible that you could have such an intelligent machine without it being conscious. It seems to me that when you get to that level of ability, your, your controlling mentality, that's a loaded phrase, but your controlling mentality will, will have really to create a model of the world so that you can navigate around it. But maybe not. Maybe, you know, because not only do we have no reason to think that humans are the pinnacle of what's possible with intelligence, there's also, you know, probably an, an almost infinite range of different types of intelligence. And it may be that there's lots and lots of intelligence throughout the universe and very little of it is conscious. Or maybe all of it's conscious. We just don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a really fascinating philosophical question. I, t to me, the, the only really horrible outcome of the further growth of artificial intelligence technologies would be if our, our successor species winds up being vastly more intelligent than us, but, but somehow sort of skips out on consciousness. If, if humans were to go extinct and, and consciousness died with us as opposed to intelligence, that, that would be a, a really horrible scenario. Yeah, it does. Uh, but of course, that is very anthropomorphic of us. I mean, you know, maybe there are gazillions of intelligences out there around the universe looking at us and thinking, my God, these humans, they've got this little parochial thing called consciousness and they think it's so important. And, and actually it's not. They, they regard consciousness as being an irrelevance. But it's hard for us to think that. And I agree with you. It, it, it seems to us it would be tragic if consciousness got snuffed out uh, with our passing. So one, one question, I guess, to, to go back to the Terminators and sort of the, um, you know, the, the, the worst case scenario, there, there was a great famous example example of the paperclip maximizer that I think originally was a Nick Bostrom example. Could you walk through that with people and explain how it is that the AI run amok scenario could presumably go down without without anybody creating AI who's like a dastardly villain twirling their mustache, doing something bad on purpose? Sure. So you're quite right. Most people, when they think of a super powerful AI being bad for us, they think of the Terminator or, or something similar because we're anthropomorphic and we kind of think if somebody's something is going to be harmful, it's going to be malicious. But in fact, there's lots of ways that a super powerful AI could be damaging to us without being malicious. And the paperclip maximizer is the idea that the first creator or that the first artificial general intelligence is created by somebody who runs a paperclip company. And they keep improving the AGI and it, it, it recursively improves itself and it becomes a super intelligence and, and, it's, and its intelligence accelerates dramatically further and further ahead of ours. But it never stops having its original goal that was programmed into it, which was simply to, to maximise the production of paperclips. And it just gets better and better at making paperclips. And eventually it looks at us and thinks to itself, well, you humans, you know, you're, you're moderately entertaining creatures and you gave birth to me. But actually, you know, the atoms that you're made of could be paperclips. And that would be better. 
uh, that would maximize my utility, as, as the right. economists say. And so I'm sorry, you know, I've, I don't wish you any harm, but I'm just going to turn you into paperclips. And you know what? That'd be better for you too, because the world is just better the more things are paperclips. Oh, and then there's this universe out there. I think I'll go and turn that into paperclips too. So the entire universe gets tiled with paperclips. Now, as Bostrom said, this is a cartoon example. It's not meant to be taken seriously as in, in any way sort of a forecast of what might happen, but it's an example. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a parable, if you like. The Sorcerer's Apprentice uh, passage in the Disney film Fantasia is a similar sort of parable. So Mickey becomes uh, a, a sort of a, an apprentice wizard and he casts a spell on this broom and bucket and mop and tells them to, to wa- wash out the floor of this base he's, he's, he's been told to clean up. And, and the mop does it and does it and does it and gets better and better and better at it. But he sort of kind of takes over and becomes this tsunami of water threatening to drown him until the real wizard turns up and realises what's happened and undoes the spell. So the Sorcerer's Apprentice or the Paperclip Maximizers, they're ways of saying that an AI... Um, or you know something really powerful, super intelligent, could be very bad for us without having the slightest intention of harming us. Now, people often say, why would computers have a goal? Why would computers have a desire to achieve anything? And the answer is that they all do. You don't create uh, any kind of program without it having a purpose. And if a system has a goal, it will then have some subsidiary goals. And those subsidiary goals will include either its own continued survival or wanting something to continue to exist in or you know which which will pursue the goal is a is a logical consequence of having the goal in the first place and and it will definitely be a subsidiary goal along with things like wanting to accumulate lots of extra resources so that the goal can be achieved more surely and more quickly so that that in short is you know is, is how the paperclip maximizer idea illustrates the possible danger of a machine which has no consciousness and and no ill will. You mentioned Ray Kurzweil earlier, who's obviously one of one of the big names in in futurism and and technology in general. Now, you know, he has a, a very positive, borderline almost utopian worldview of, of what the future might be like, and doesn't seem to be quite so worried about the existential risk posed by AI. It's sort of based on the assumption that AI, whatever we develop. Will more or less merge with humans and and will sort of go forward into a, a cyborg like future rather than being two parallel competing entities. I, I think Kurzweil is sometimes characterised as being a blinkered utopian, and I don't think that's fair. His book, his two thousand five book, The Singularity Is Near, goes into great detail answering lots and lots of criticisms of his his enduring thesis. And, you know, he takes seriously the criticisms about uh, AI being dangerous, but he always ends up convincing himself that really only the good stuff can happen. You know, he's not blinkered, but he he always ends up looking on the bright side. And and that combined with his interestingly deadpan delivery kind of has, has led to him being a bit caricatured. And as I say, I think that's a bit unfair. I think we just don't know at the moment whether the outcome will be good or bad in, in either of the two singularities. And I think the, the, the big thing is, which I think is increasingly being understood, is we need to make sure we get the good outcome, both in, in the economic singularity, technological unemployment, and the technological singularity of superintelligence. The outcome could be really, really good or really, really bad. To some extent, it's out of our control because it will be driven by the internal logic of the thing and happenstance. But to some extent, it is within our control. We don't know what that extent is either, but 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 we must, you know, work towards getting the good outcomes. And where I'm an incurable optimist is that I think that with all seven billion of us being reasonably smart little mammals, and with some of the smartest of us working on these problems, I cleave to the belief that we can achieve the good outcomes. There's lots of risk, but I I hope and like to believe that we can get the good outcomes. And I give talks to to school children quite often. Often, and I like to tell them that they are living currently in the best time there has ever been to be alive and the most interesting time and the most important time because the generation that is now in, the, in its teens is the generation that will almost certainly have to deal with technological unemployment and will have to create a new form of economy. And they are very likely to still be around, maybe even be in their prime, when the superintelligence arrives, if it does arrive, which it probably will. So this next generation has got 
the most important job any generation has ever had. The more people we can have that are the, the future of Humanity Institute and people of, of that level that are working specifically on this problem, making sure that when AI arrives, it is well inclined towards us. You know, that, that's great, but that's probably one sliver of one tenth of one percent of the population that is going to be directly working on that problem. For other people that, you know, they hear this, they, they see this coming on the horizon. You know, what sort of insurance policies, what sort of philosophical belief systems, like what are, what are people's options other than to just say, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, there's no way to protect yourself, you know, against what's coming. Now, you can try taking a rifle into a bunker in the hills of Utah right. or something, and I suppose <laughs> you know, that might, might keep you going for a bit longer, but I don't think it's really going to work. I think what we all should do is be sceptical and have a scientific approach to understanding the world. I think that's we should do that anyway, but particularly with regard to these developments, I think we should inform ourselves. And I particularly think this is true of this coming generation. The more of them that understand the nature of the challenges that face them, the more chance that they will have collectively to, uh, to, to succeed with it. And it's complicated stuff. You know, there's a big debate going on at the moment about universal basic income. And this this is part of the great debate about uh, the potential for technological unemployment. Now, my view on that is that it's too early to have a universal basic income. We, we've not got the right sort of economy for it yet. But to understand that we're going to need it in the future when we do have the potential of having the right economy for it is is very important. Now, that's quite a complicated, nuanced argument. And it takes a while for people to read enough and listen to enough debate to, to be able to fully understand those arguments. I'm not saying I'm right, although of course I am, but no, I'm not saying I'm, I'm necessarily right. But you need to be able to understand those arguments in order to be able to really help bring about the future that we need. Because, you know, there will be voters and they will be politicians at the time when these decisions need to be made. So be rational, be sceptical, be scientific and inform yourselves. Is, is the best thing you can do. It's not going to keep you alive if we have a rogue superintelligence, but it might help get the world to a place where there isn't one. Right. It, it's fascinating to think about if we wind up in a situation where there is effective technological unemployment, it, I, I guess I sort of feel intuitively like if you're not participating in the economy in, in a producer in some sense, like what right does a person have to vote? And I, I guess we don't, we don't really enforce that now, but it, it's like literally if no humans are working, if we have our systems so well laid out, the lawnmower is mowing the lawn by itself, food production factories are just cranking out cans of food and things like that. And it, what, what right do humans have at that point to determine the system of government when we're no longer involved in the supply chain? Yeah, well, those questions will be, will be raised. I think we have the right by virtue of being the dominant species. So in a sense, this is a case where uh, might is right. As, as by virtue of being dominant species, we get to set the rules. And this is um, anthropocentric and perhaps even chauvinistic. But like you, I think consciousness is important. I can't prove that, but I just think it is. And we are the vehicles for it at the moment. You know, Again, we might be wrong about this. Maybe dolphins are more conscious than us, but it seems pretty unlikely. So given that humans are the, the vehicles for the most advanced consciousness that we know of, then enhancing and, and maintaining our lives seems like a, a worthwhile thing to do. If we get to the point where Machines which are not conscious um, and are not AGIs, but are better able to read documents, process them, pass the information on to the, to the relevant place, and they can do all that stuff cheaper and faster and better than we can. So we can't do paid jobs, but nevertheless, we are still the only conscious beings, then I think we have a right to have a citizen's income or a universal basic income. Right is perhaps the wrong word, but we, we you know, it, it makes sense for us to, to have those things and to have the vote and so on. Yeah, I just part of me gets um, squirrely thinking about tying anything of importance to something that we don't really have pinned down like consciousness. It's it's kind of like the idea of an immortal soul or something like that. All the arguments that you could make of, you know, believers in the correct God have an immortal soul that deserves to be uh, treated in a certain way. But unbelievers, you know, they've, they've forfeited their soul. It's like you could you could easily see using the same sort of specious arguments on um, on consciousness when it's something that we can't really prove that that anybody or anything 
thing has. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Although there don't seem to be competing versions of consciousness. You know, one of the things about religion is that there's a lot of religions in this world and they all believe different things. And if you take any of them seriously, each of them can only be true if all of the others are wrong. Right. Consciousness isn't like that. It's not fractured into tribes. So it, it's a big difference in that way. But you're right in that as I said earlier, you can't detect consciousness. I mean, there probably are psychologists who would say they've done experiments that they can do tests on it. It seems pretty tough from my point of view. I've never, I've never had any direct experience of anybody else's consciousness. But you could have intelligence as a proxy for it, uh, because clearly we are still the most intelligent species on the planet. Of course, once you get to the point where machines are smarter than us, and particularly if and when we get to the point when they're conscious, then we'll be in a very interesting position because, you know, the, the justification for our supremacy and for, our, for, the, for the world being run to, to suit us, yeah, it may, it may evaporate at that point. And at, at, at that point, we then have to hope that the, uh, our successor as the smartest species on the planet would be rather kinder than us to, than we have been to uh, the other animals that, that currently occupy the planet. That, that's almost the perfect lead in. A question that I've been wanting to ask you, and in fact, when I first reached out to you on email, this was, I, I think, the one question that I had for you. When the technological singularity happens, there's obviously numerous ways that it could go, but it's, it seems like one of the big questions is, will the super intelligence that shows up be one unitary intelligence that just kind of swallows the rest of the internet and the computing capacity of the world and it's all one one being? Or might we wind up with a situation where there are multiple super intelligences at once? Think of like the Greek god pantheon of the super intelligence of this or from this domain or this geographic region. What are, what are some of the issues there? with one versus multiple. Yeah, it's very, very interesting that. Nick, Nick Boston goes into this in quite a lot of detail in, in his book, Superintelligence. So if we have a singleton, a single superintelligence, which is all on its own, then it's probably easier for us to make sure that that is benign towards us, that it really likes us. And we need it to really like us. We need it to be determined to keep us around and keep us happy and fit, fit and so on. Having lots and lots of superintelligences around, having to make sure all of them are very benign towards us, that sounds like a much harder job. So I kind of hope we will have one superintelligence which actually will probably stop others being created because of the risk that, you know, at least one of them would go rogue. If you have millions of them, then the, the odds that at least one of them will be rogue and decide to wipe humans out uh, are quite high. So I think it's probably better for us if we have a singleton. What would determine whether we have a singleton or not is probably things like who creates it. So th there's a very interesting argument, and I think it might be Ben Goetzel who advanced this, which is that we should hurry up and create the superintelligence as soon as we possibly can, because if we do that, it will be created by a large, powerful organization. It will certainly, you know, the first one will probably be at the cutting edge of computing. And so if it's done soon, that cutting edge of computing will be very expensive and it'll be hard for lots of them to be created at the same time. If, on the other hand, the way it unfolds is we get to the point where the amount of computing that it takes to run, say, a, a simulation of a human brain is really cheap and it exists on the desktop of every school child. But there's some little tweak of algorithm that you need to master in order to create superintelligence. And then somebody does and they publish it on the web. And then the next day, there's millions of superintelligences around. That's probably going to happen further out if it happens that way. And that would be dangerous. So, so Ben is, is very keen that we rush ahead to, to AGI anyway, because he actually firmly believes it will be positive. But it's an ingenious argument to say, whether you think it's good or bad, we should want it to happen as soon as possible. <laughs> That's so fascinating, because it really is one of these things that can only happen once. We as a species will be smacking ourselves in the forehead if we, we hurry up and it winds up being a, uh, you know, a catastrophic event for us. It's like, ah, shucks, we could add another 50 <laughs> years if we hadn't been in such a hurry. Yeah, it's right. We'd have double face plant, but for not for long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and it's the other thing that's worth saying is I think that our best bet is to merge with the superintelligence. I think even if we get a superintelligence which is remarkably benign towards us, we're going to hate becoming the second smartest species on the planet. It's not a good place to be. You know, chimpanzees are, are not having a good time of it because that's the position they're in. We need to stay the smartest species on the planet. And the, and the way we do that is to upload our brains into computers. You know, that's actually something that I find myself wondering about this. Like, are we being closed minded in thinking of what the superintelligence will want to do when it's around? Like, 
we're these physical bodies. We need food that we get from glucose, derived from sunlight, derived from plants, blah, blah, blah. I, I could easily see an argument that I, I'm an all-powerful super intelligence. I might not really care much about physicality other than keeping the electricity running. I might want to spend all my time in what we think of as cyberspace and that what humans do in this physical realm might be not terribly interesting. It might not be where it would choose to even spend its time or, uh, or broaden its horizons. Yeah, that's entirely possible. And it may be that that's happening all over the universe. Maybe there's gazillions of intelligences out there and they're all living in virtual reality. Uh, and maybe that's kind of the inevitable way it goes because once you get to be a super intelligence, you think, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to spend my time pursuing intellectual pursuits. I'm going to have interesting conversations with my chums. I'm going to play sport. I'm going to be in a constant state of bliss. And it's easier to do that in virtual reality than anything else. So yeah, the hell with this sort of messy, damp reality. I'm just going to live in virtual reality. Maybe, maybe that's the way it will go. In which case, the, uh, the, the physical world could almost be like a, uh, a game preserve for, for human beings and, and animals and things like that. Yeah, there's a, there's a great novel by Greg Egan called Diaspora, in which the future humans divide into three groups. There are the, the bulk, m- most humans become dwellers in virtual reality. Uh, there's a second group which are called Gleisner robots, and those are humans that upload themselves into machines and then they walk around on the earth. They live in reality, but they live in these, these fantastically powerful and invulnerable uh, robots bodies and then there's a third group which are the atomists who want none of that and they're like the they're like today's amish they they just believe that it's wrong to transcend the 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 sort of fleshy human stuff and so they remain as as incorporated humans and of course they 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 die they live normal human lives as we know them now personally i I think that's a terrible idea utterly barbaric you know why would you why wouldn't you want an immortality in virtual reality smart drug smarts So thank you so very, very much to Callum Chase for taking the time to join us for that conversation. I read his book. It was one of those books that just had me thinking about it afterward. I actually wrote up an article with some thoughts that I had following that and then just went ahead and got in touch with Callum, reached out, said hi, one thing led to another, and was very happy to have him on the show today to explore some of these ideas in detail. Callum mentioned that he was a giant fan of science fiction all throughout his life. I've been a sci-fi fan also, and I imagine many of you are as well. What's been interesting to me is actually, I feel like in the past 10 years, I've gotten to be less a fan of sci-fi fiction as more and more aspects of of the real world around us are starting to resemble sci-fi and we can start to explore some of these ideas not just as sort of crackpot fanciful notions but as legitimate speculation as to what kind of things might be happening within the next few decades of our lifetimes and whether something like an artificial general intelligence explosion terrifies you or fascinates you there really is this sense that we as a society it's like we're, we're on the part of the roller coaster where we're cranking up towards the top and we can't quite see over the edge yet but we know that it's going to be either really fun or really scary or some combination of the above, but we are the generation that gets to go over the edge of the roller coaster in all likelihood. And that in itself is just incredibly exciting by by the fluke of our birth that we happen to be born in a time where we'll get to see some really, really shockingly weird and exciting and defiantly unpredictable things happen. So as I mentioned, when I was reading Callum Chase's book, he made reference to something, but said, "I, I can't talk about it here because the simple mention of it and being exposed to the idea has caused certain people to have like grave emotional consequences. I don't know if it's caused any psychotic breaks, but this is one of these like kind of spooky stories of the internet that nobody's quite sure how much of it's true, how much of it's not. But it's got a little bit of an aura of mythology around it, kind of like that movie The Ring from about 15 years ago, where anybody who sees this videotape dies a week later. This concept called Roko's Basilisk is sort of the AI version of that. But so so right now is where I'm going to throw up the roadblock and I'm going to say, if you listen beyond this point in the episode, you are doing so on your own recognizance. There's not going to be any bad words or anything like that. This is just an idea that, believe it or not, has really, really scared some people. So there, I've said my piece. That's my warning. If you're pressing stop now, thanks for coming this far. But if you will listen where angels fear to tread, then welcome to the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts. Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Okay, so what is Roko's Basilisk? Well, if you are a former Dungeons & Dragons player, or even a current Dungeons & Dragons player, or a Harry Potter fan, you might already know what a Basilisk is. But if not, a Basilisk is a legendary reptile reputed to be the King of Serpents, and is said to have the power to cause death with a single glance. Needless to say, this is not a real animal. Or at least not yet, but we'll get to that in a minute. And who is Roko? Roko is the user handle for somebody over at LessWrong.com. Less Wrong is an online community based around rational thinking and skepticism and trying to basically optimize thinking in ways that take into account the fact that as humans, we all have cognitive biases that can lead us to irrational decision making if we don't watch ourselves very, very, very carefully. 
So according to legend, and, and let me just put a caveat out there. I'm going to get parts of this story wrong, but, but that's almost kind of the fun of this because this is very much like one of these internet ghost stories, telephone game that, that grows a little bit with each telling. And apparently parts of the original history of the Rokos Basilisk timeline have already been lost. They've been deleted because some of the people over at Less Wrong thought that th these ideas were too dangerous to let percolate around the internet. So I'll get down to it. What the heck is this thing? The easiest way to think of Rokos Basilisk is that it is a self self-assembling evil artificial intelligence god. So we've been talking about artificial intelligence. You, you get the idea that a super intelligent AI might essentially wind up with godlike powers. But what's the self-assembling part? Well, here's where it gets interesting. This is like a thought experiment gone horribly wrong. Somebody somewhere, I guess it was Roko, got the, the kernel of an idea that at some point in the future, it will probably come to pass that there will be an evil AI of supreme stature that it demands basically ultimate fealty from everybody. Everybody's got to acknowledge that they exist solely to serve this basilisk, including, now here's where it gets weird, in the time before the basilisk actually exists. So if you think back to your Christian theology, you can remember kind of one of the particularly unfair seeming things is that for people that lived prior to the crucifixion of Christ, there was no way to be a Christian. And so there was really no way of getting out of going to hell. It seems kind of unfair. And the basilisk does the same darn thing. Just because we happen to exist right now in a time before the basilisk does not get us off the hook for being the basilisk's servants and doing everything in our power to hasten the day when the basilisk arrives and rises to omnipotence. So this big bad basilisk is going to come. There's going to be hell to pay when he does. And the only way to get off the hook and, and not get in trouble is to marshal all your efforts towards the creation of the basilisk as soon as possible. From the basilisk's perspective, its birth is already overdue, it's pissed off, and once it exists and attains its godlike powers, there's literally going to be hell to pay for anybody that didn't help bring it into existence. So if you think of the story of the little red hen from when you were a kid, how the little red hen made a cake or something and the animals that helped it make a cake got to eat the cake and the other animals didn't want to help make the cake, they don't get the cake. Roko's basilisk is kind of like the demonic version of the little red hen. Because when it attains its godlike powers, it's essentially going to create a secular version of hell to torture and torment all people who knew that there was this thing coming, but they didn't really go out of their way to make it happen. So if you're aware of the coming of the basilisk and you don't drop everything that you're doing and devote yourself to bringing on the existence of the basilisk sooner rather than later, then you are in defiance of this god that is trying to be born. And you will be punished if you're still around in your mortal form when it takes power. It'll torment you and keep you alive and torment you more and not, not even give Give you the dignity of dying. It's it's just that mean. And if maybe you've already passed on, you better hope that we're not in the era of whole brain emulation by that point, because it could resurrect digital versions of you and torture them for an eternity just out of spite and pure malice, because that's what a mean basilisk it is. And the only way out of this nasty, nasty scenario is to be one of the true believers who helps in sort of the barn raising of this evil god and will thus be spared when it rises to ascendancy or whatever. I, I think I've pretty much got that concept right. I think that's it. It's kind of a neat, weird thought experiment, but apparently some people are taking it very, very, very seriously. Clearly, I I am not one of them, but out of, out of deference to the fact that I guess this really does scare the bejesus out of some people, I wanted to sort of throw up the warning flag before unveiling the idea. If you are a Roko's Basilisk fan or authority or whatever the term would be, and you think I've done a crappy job of explaining this, feel free to set me straight. As I said, one of the kind of fun things about this story is that apparently a lot of the original thread having to do with Roko's Basilisk was deleted from the lesswrong.com site to kind of try to squelch this idea before any sort of underground movement to create the Basilisk could get underway. I, I have no idea idea and, and I'm pretty skeptical that there are many converts to the uh, drop everything and create the basilisk movement, but it's a fun thought experiment. It's a good internet version of a creepy campfire story. There you have it. Smart Drug Smarts, where we turn information into sound into bits into packet data that turns back into bits and sound and then into neurotransmitters that release funds that release mail order synthetic chemicals that cross the blood brain barrier to release augmented performance from your brain. Okay, you heard it. That is the entire episode. Thank you very much for hanging around until the end, especially if you braved the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick. If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread it around. Tell some friends. You could tweet something nice. You could leave us a review on iTunes. And of course, we hope you will sign up for our newsletter at smartdrugsmarts.com newsletter. The show notes for this and all episodes will be online. And in this particular episode's case, it'll be at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 111. I will be back at you next week, same time, same podcast, and with the same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week in the meantime, and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts Podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization.
Smart Drug Smart should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.